So we have time for two questions, maybe. So who would like to ask a question? If you can raise your hand. Yes. Nicolas Veron at Bruegel in Brussels and the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was uh, impressed by your presentation of the uh, shift to the left of the Chinese economic policy, which you dated back to 2007. And the point you made, if I heard you correctly, is that Xi Jinping is departing from the previous strategy of reform and opening up. So I'd like to ask you about the Chinese uh, application to CPTPP, which on the face of it and rhetorically is very aligned with reform and opening up uh, again um, in appearance. In the previous panel, we heard Mark Noland uh, of the Peterson Institute saying, if I heard him correctly, that uh, he took the application seriously and he expected it to succeed. And we also heard Ambassador Lee of South Korea uh, taking essentially the opposite view, which is that the application was there just for the sake of application, but, but not for the sake of joining uh, CPTPP. So I'd like to have your view, obviously from the standpoint uh, of both geographical and of your experience. Uh, is China serious about joining CPTPP or is it just for show? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think um, what we face with um, China on trade policy uh, is China recognizing that it has a window of opportunity given protectionism within the United States Congress and the unlikelihood of the United States re-embracing uh, the TPP uh, anytime soon. Even though, for example, my think tank, the Asia Society, has recommended that the administration begin to do so sectorally um, through a recent piece written by my Vice President, Wendy Cutler, the former Deputy USTR, uh, which you can find on the Asia Society website and in Foreign Affairs magazine, and only about three or four weeks ago. Um, but the Chinese um, estimation is that American domestic politics will prevent them from moving either comprehensively on the TPP and probably impede them from doing so segmentally. So I do not see this as just for show. Um, I see this action by China as a bit like occupying a um, geostrategic or geoeconomic vacuum to pay to, uh, which has been created by a still protectionist America and to underline to the world that protectionism didn't die with Donald Trump, it continues today. So that's at a level of international political symbolism. On the substance of it, um, I believe the Chinese uh, are serious uh, if they can get away with it. And the reason I say that, it, it, this has been the subject of enormous internal analysis by Chinese think tanks since the TPP was first um, muted in fact, at the end of my own period in political office. Uh, and I had long discussions with President Obama at the time, but the TPP was the natural, as it were, economic pillar uh, to what was then described as the American pivot to Asia. You'd have a geopolitical pivot, but minus an economic pivot, and frankly, would ultimately fail. Um, so for those reasons, um, the Chinese have been researching this possibility for themselves for the better part of the last five years. And the Chinese do not put up their hand for a fun. They usually put it up with deep strategic purpose. Um, the final point though I'd say is, will the Chinese actually succeed in uh, being accepted? Given their current uh, reorientation towards the left on economic policy uh, to make, uh, frankly, China more protectionist uh, at home, uh, and more mercantilist abroad, more interventionist at home on behalf of the state, um, and less uh, yielding to international market principles abroad, and for China to continue to cross-subsidize its major global state-owned enterprises now with massive injection of state industry funds, not marginal, but massive, the equivalent of 10 to 15% of GDP, 1.5 trillion, in, um, in, in dollar amounts. I think it would be very hard, purely at an analytical level, 
for the uh, open economies of East Asia, like the ROK, Japan and Australia, uh, to, to say that t China should be accepted. Of course, the critical decision makers here will probably be Japan and I think Australia. Australia has already indicated under the current Conservative government that they would not support uh, China's accession. That's partly a product of the uh, the uh, policy of economic coercion currently being adopted by China against Australia. Um, but it also, I think, reflects a wider view across economists that China is now less amenable to a definition as being a market economy than it was when we granted China market economy status back in 2001, 2002 in order to gain accession to the WTO. So I therefore, on balance, am skeptical so, but the open question is, will the prospect of TPP membership um, enable the, the remaining economic reformers who are now in the minority in the Chinese system an ability to regain the platform, regain uh, a position of power in the same way that happened after China entered the WTO or had the prospect of entering the WTO 20 years ago to leverage more ambitious market reforms than would otherwise have been possible? Well, thank you very much. We are, already, we are already over time, but I will take briefly two last questions. So the two questions together, uh, that is Karl Kaiser, Igor Jurgens, and I am sorry, it's finished. So uh, Karl Kaiser, Igor Jurgens, and we wind up. Karl. Karl Kaiser Kennedy School. As you contemplate the geopolitical structure that's emerging, could you share with us your views on how you see the role of Europe besides the UK, France with its Indo-Pacific position, and the European Union? So that's Karl Kaiser. Igor Jurgens, how do you see the Russian role? That's the question. No? More or less. <laughs> Kevin, thank you very much. Excellent analysis. Uh, assertiveness at home means assertiveness abroad and that means proletarian internationalism and building up the blocks. Uh, Shanghai Organization of Cooperation. The role of Russia in extending authoritarianism against liberal democracy. What do you think about that? Uh, and where Russia stand, uh, you know, steps in to, to help Mr. Xi Jinping to, to assert himself. So, uh, Igor, if you allow me, your first question is very much related to mine about the capitalism, uh, the two styles of capitalism. Anyway, you, you will conclude, Kevin, and I will add a footnote. Are you welcome in China anymore? Moi? You. Je crois. Pas de problème. <laughs> okay, so uh, you, you can have a visa. Yeah, I, I have a continued visa. And uh, I speak with Chinese think tanks all the time um, and in open forums with the Chinese foreign minister and various other Chinese ministers. So um, I use my think tank capacity to do that, whatever the current state of relations may be between the Australian Conservative government and the, uh, and the Chinese government. So um, I maintain my autonomy, independence and freedom of uh, travel and manoeuvre. But as you can appreciate, Thierry, it becomes more and more shall we say, interesting. Um, uh, Igor, thank you for the question. Uh, always good and uh, wonderful to have a great provocative Russian question at forums like this, which is why I uh, always enjoy my times in Moscow and Petersburg and elsewhere, and Vladivostok in recent times. Um, let me put it to you in a slightly different way, Igor, is that, and I'm not seeking to be provocative here, I'm just seeking to explore a question. Um, I think the American policy failure in Afghanistan uh, is uh, being quite damaging uh, for American global prestige. Uh, that's my serious analysis. Um, that is someone who, as a Prime Minister of Australia, loyally committed Australian troops to Afghanistan over a long period of time, as did the French Republic and others. However, um, uh, the emerging challenge in Afghanistan um, is China's predisposition to uh, have growing influence in Central Asia as well. 
while not, as it were, making the mistake as they would see it of the former Soviet Union and the United States in becoming so domestically embroiled in Afghanistan that there is no way of exit. However, China has a number of economic interests to pursue in Afghanistan, Afghanistan as well, not least in minerals um, and at, at a very large scale. The open question is, can the Chinese prosecute a modus vivendi with the Taliban, uh, which has eluded all previous external powers? Open question, given that you know, uh, Igor, the Taliban is not, not a single a multifarious entity. But I make a broader point here in terms of the Russian Federation. China, through both the Belt and Road Initiative and through its new Afghanistan strategy, will become a bigger and bigger geostrategic player across Eurasia. And the question I have as an analyst, not as a politician, is at what point does that frankly create a fundamental tension uh, with Moscow? I know um, Vladimir Putin's relationship with Xi Jinping is very good, but I'm looking at the structural dynamics of where this takes us over the next decade uh, and decade and a half as China rises in Central Asia. BRI, Digital Silk Road, uh, plus Afghanistan, and the rest. Second um, response uh, is to the point uh, raised uh, about uh, the role of the European Union in Europe more broadly. And I think if I've got the question right in relation to, as it were, China strategy. Um, I have a view about this which uh, is not shared by the current Conservative government in Australia, apparently. And that view is that Europe matters in a fundamental way. And the reason I say that is not because I'm you know, a Europhile. As you've already heard, I speak very bad French. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the truth is when the world is looked at through the lens of Beijing, they see a number of locus of power. They see primarily the United States and its Pacific allies. Then they see uh, uh, the European Union, led by Germany and France. Um, and then they see uh, Mother Russia uh, for historical uh, uh, reasons going back to Peter the Great, the whole problem of the non-resolution of the border until, frankly, Gorbachev and Dunn. Um, and also uh, a combined community of interest with the United States. In many respects, therefore, geopolitically, Europe and the European Union represents the swing state in China's perception of global geopolitics for the next decade. Therefore, where Europe goes is really important. Um, and one of my big critiques, for example, of the Australian government's recent handling of the so-called AUKUS arrangement, including the um, unilateral cancellation of the submarine contract with France and the French provider, is that it completely ignored the significance of France, the significance of the European Union in the future direction of global, as it were, China strategy. If Europe, led by France and Germany, is in the Indo-Pacific, frankly, that is better for all countries in terms of re-establishing a future balance of power with China. To ignore Europe and to ignore France and frankly to insult them in fact, it heads in the reverse direction. So I have in, on this question a view which is that Europe is central to this equation. It is the swing state, uh, maybe not in pure military terms, but it is the swing state, I think, in foreign policy terms and certainly in global economic terms. I'll leave it there, Thierry. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I think we are going to stop here. Best wishes and we all hope to see you soon in person somewhere. Goodbye. A bientôt, mon ami. Thank you. <laughs>